Hello everyone, welcome back to the True Footy Podcast, 104 I think it is, uh, and today we have got some football topics, mostly around the draft. In the days following the draft, I did put out a post on YouTube asking for some questions for a Q&A style video, um, which I think will be long enough to justify it as a podcast, so this will also be available on your audio platforms as well, but uh, many people were kind enough to uh, contribute to the to the show, I suppose, and there's a bunch of questions to go through in today's podcast as well. So this may or may not be the last football-related one for the year. It probably is, uh, unless something crazy happens, but that will probably be a video anyway. So today I've just got a, a variety of questions uh, broadly about the draft and then some non-draft questions related as well. As an aside, I just want to thank you all as well uh, for the amazing support on the uh, iTunes 30 podcast. That was great. That podcast did not go quite the way I had originally planned it. Um, I'm actually thinking of doing a part two to clarify some of the things maybe said in part one. Um, Not that there was anything wrong in there, it's just perhaps just a few things that once I'd settled down and watch it back, I uh, I wish I'd said better. So um, yeah, I I think I've got more to say, but that will probably make that the next podcast on this channel. So uh, for now, we're gonna get into some questions. Like I said, uh, there's like 30 questions or something like that. I, I whittled down a few because there's a bunch that I subsequently did a video about anyway. So I will shout out a bunch of people um, who contributed to the show. Before we get into it, I will give you a quick message from our sponsor. Sorry guys, I'm just gonna pause the video there for one moment to bring you an important message from Druzy's Athlete Academy. Now, as we wrap up the 2023 season, it's time to map out your goals for next season. Now, if you're a young footballer or general athlete, actually, your coach may have highlighted areas for improvement going into next year, such as adding muscle mass, improving your running ability, or enhancing your explosiveness. Now, you probably know where you roughly want to be by the end of preseason, but you're probably unsure about the most effective way to get there. Now, helpfully, Druzy has three years experience working with elite level footballers. As a result, he's learned and applied strength and conditioning strategies that will help deliver concrete results. Now, these results that you're going to get go beyond just mere numbers you know, superficial stuff like increasing your bench press or trimming a couple of seconds off your 2km time trial. The methods that you get through the Druzy's Athlete Academy are actually tailored to your specific needs as an athlete. Now, beyond these superficial quantifiable gains, the feedback that the athletes at Druzy's Athlete Academy often give are that their training has actually translating in their game going to another level. Some of the feedback has been that people are able to tackle with more force or confidently break away from contests, they're able to kick further and being stronger in marking contests. Now, you know know where you want to be by the end of preseason. Druzy has the experience and knowledge and results to get you where you want to be. Now there's a limited time offer through Druzy's Athlete Academy where there are 10 different free one week trials. So essentially all you have to do to express interest in this is go find Druzy's Athlete Academy on Instagram and DM him the message free preseason. I'll leave the information of how to contact Druzy in the description of this video. So these one week trials are fantastic because obviously with no strings attached, you can experience the program risk free. Take action today, start building the foundations for a really strong next season. And if you do end up going through a program for Druzy's Athlete Academy, remember to use the code TRUE4020 for 20% off. Thanks guys, we'll get back to video now. Great. So before we crack into the actual podcast itself, uh, I'll go through some questions that I filtered out purely because I've made videos on them. So uh, there's one from HMYV2 who um, asked a question about Father, Son and Academy prospects coming up in 2024. Uh, I've done a video called um, an early look at the 2024 draft where I highlight some of these. One exception that I missed there is Malachi Champion from uh, Subiaco, I think. He's certainly from WA. He counts as a next generation Academy talent for West Coast. Uh, however, I think obviously under current rules, if he goes in the first round, he can't be matched. So technically another NGA that I forgot to mention in that video. Uh, but if you want a more in-depth look at that video uh, for you know father-son stuff as well. Uh, then we had a bunch of questions about uh, the NGA system and, um, and the academies in general. And that was before I made that video. So shout out to Rogue Riot, Mitch Smith. Thanks for your question, guys. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen that video yet, but on the channel, you will find um, a video called the AFL Academy Problem. Then we have Tree Stumps, or Three Stumps, sorry. Could you do a video on players that are likely to leave their clubs? Yeah, so I've done a little bit of previewing 2024 in terms of like players who are out of contract already on the channel. I think I called it AFL 2024 Predictions. And then I've done an AFL 2024 Pre-Agents video as well. Um, So that's probably there to get you by in the meantime. Uh, But I'll keep it on the back burner in terms of like retirements, last chance players. I think I I get what you're saying there a little bit more in depth. That that can be something I look at in a future video. Um, Then there's a couple of questions from uh, I'm made out of brown mess. 
and L. Curran, uh, both about the Rising Star. Again, I've done a Rising Star video, so you can check that out on the channel. Um, and Shannon Humphreys asked about my thoughts on the Eagles Draft Hall. Again, I've made a lot of Eagles Draft content since then, so you can find all that stuff. Uh, Matthew Pollock, friend of the channel, has asked, uh, how was my birthday? Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, it was good, thanks, mate. It was good. I caught up with someone that I made friends with in Athens uh, the night before, and then on the day, it was just all about content, to be honest. That's how I spent most of my birthday, and then my roommate's family had me over for dinner, so it was wonderful. But uh, thank you for asking. Let's get into the proper podcast, uh, so to speak. So we've got a question from Chris D85, who says, hey, Jesse, love your work. Thank you, mate. Uh, my question is around my club, Essendon. Do you feel Caddy was a good choice ahead of O'Sullivan? Personally, I would have gone with a key back at that pick as gun key backs are hard to find. And we have to start planning for Zach Reed to be more of a bonus if he comes on due to injuries. What are your thoughts? So I'm not super uh, aware of exactly where Zach Reed's um, you know, at in terms of his own development, other than the fact that we haven't seen him a lot at AFL level, vaguely aware that he was injured. So yeah, obviously Zach Reed, for those who don't know, was a top 10 draft pick that Essendon acquired as a key back. Um, and uh, what Chris is suggesting here is that perhaps another key back would have been the best option there. Well, uh, the only place I would disagree with that is just the the, the notion that uh, key backs are hard to come by. I mean, sure, they are in a sense, like good ones. Um, good versions of anything are hard to come by, I guess. But key backs, when you compare them to the, like the ratio of key forwards or quality key forwards in drafts, I think you'll find that key forwards are generally harder to come by. So I think Essendon knew that they couldn't get Caddy had um, had Geelong had that pick, or at least that's what they assumed. It might not have been the case at all. Or another club might have traded. I, I found out like West Coast uh, was one club that tried to trade for Caddy but got rejected. So I think with Essendon's list, you know, to some extent you sort of back in Reed to try and get himself right. And I don't know if they had an equivalent talent forward uh, to Caddy on their list already. So you got like Weedham in there, it's Harrison Jones. Um, and their forward line's good. Obviously, Peter Wright's not really nearing retirement at all. I think he's born in 96, 2014 draft, I think. Uh, so I think uh, Caddy's a good one because he's both a short-term plus. I think he can come in and play as a third tall early uh, to boost that forward line. But also, longer term, I think he projects as a good talent. So I honestly think it would be more replaceable finding another key back. Maybe not specifically Conor O'Sullivan. Depends how good he is. But... Um, you know, I probably would have gone Curtin over Caddy, but uh, Caddy over O'Sullivan, I think it kind of makes sense for Essendon. I think uh, I think the value proposition of that was good, and they ended up having you know several picks anyway. I don't think that second round really cost them too much. Second question from you, Cat, the resident stinky Man United fan. Actually, no, I forgot about Jeruzzi. That was the other one. Uh, UCAT says, do you think Freo should should have been more attacking in their attempt to get an out-and-out -out winger coming through the ranks in brackets O'Driscoll, I presume, referencing Aiden O'Driscoll, who got drafted to the Western Bulldogs? Or do you think that going for scoreboard impacting mid uh, or that a scoreboard impacting mid in Simpson is exactly what will elevate Freo's game? So the first thing I would say to this is that given where Fremantle started with respect to this draft, um, you know, later picks. So I think they had a late second was their first pick and then, you know, a third rounder and maybe like a fourth round. I can't remember, but it wasn't a great draft hand. And I think when attacking a draft with that from that sort of position, it's hard to really prioritize need too much. I think it, that in this case where the draft kind of fell away, it was kind of a case of which talents do we think are AFL quality and add something that we don't already have. And that, that's what I think Cooper Simpson is. Specifically on O'Driscoll, uh, I don't know if he would have been best available at any of those picks. Obviously, it's early days, but I don't think he had, you know, like for instance, you compare him to a Cooper Simpson, he was never really in the frame to go in the 30s. Um, so I didn't just go win about where I expected. In fact, I think I had him undrafted. I, I did several mocks, um, which doesn't mean he won't be good. And he would have probably fit Fremantle's needs potentially um, as a wingman when you've just lost Liam Henry. But I don't think Fremantle's position in the draft allowed them for to go for, you know, take a punt on really speculative players like that. I think best available made sense. And as it happened, they got three players that were good value. I mean, Simpson's probably about right. That's about right for where he went. But Ollie Murphy and, and Jack Deline were massive sliders uh, to different extents. So I think Fremantle played it as best they could. If they really wanted to, you know, recruit a wingman, there's other ways to do that. And obviously, Jeremy Sharp's coming on. So... Jeremy Sharp, probably just as good as option as O'Driscoll, to be honest. 
So that is my opinion on that. Uh, we have Moldy Cheese, 2749. With a new leadership sitting in AFL HQ, do you think they will make any changes to the draft next year? Uh, okay, so a reason I kept this question in is I've already I've already done an Academy's video talking about uh, maybe some suggestions, but also like mapping out the system. Uh, but this question is, do you think they will make any changes to the draft? I think they will. I think the AFL is pretty good at listening to clubs and, and snapping back. And um, the NGA rule going back to 40 was a snap reaction to, um, I guess, a lot of guns going in the top. Well, certainly Jamari Hagen. sorry. Um, Jamari Hagen was the reason they pushed it back to 20, I presume. Because uh, it happened not long after that, and then in 22 uh, was it, or 21, sorry, Windhager and Owens were two really good guns to come out of it. And I don't know if it was because of that that they moved it back to 40. So my point being, the AFL will keep snapping rules left, right, and center, um, and then snapping them back. So I think there's definitely potential for them to make another change. And I think they'll listen to clubs' feedback in this case because, as I said in that academy video it's not enough of an incentive for clubs to invest in their academies if they can't match top 40 prospects. So we saw like four or five NGA prospects go in the, in the top 40 and none could be matched. So kind of defeats the purpose there. So I do think there will be a change. What exactly is probably maybe the top 30 and then see, see how clubs react to that. Uh, maybe top 20. Bem Gaddy uh, says the changes that he would make to the draft are the first round is only the top 18 picks and that academy bids can only be placed after the first round for all teams. And he asked my thoughts. Okay, so I agree on the first round only being 18 picks, um, with the exception of maybe band one compensation. So in this case, Ben Mackay's compensation pick uh, and having North two and three, uh, that I think both should count obviously in the first round, but then you know it shouldn't push Collingwood out of the first round, who won the flag. So in this case, it would go to 19, but I do agree that after the Premier's pick, whether they have it or whether they trade it, that is the last pick in the first round, including all these end of first, first round priority picks and compensation picks and the, the draft blowing out to 29 picks in terms of the first round, I think was a weird decision. I'm sure in the past they haven't done that. I think they mix and match which uh, what's first round and what's not. And it is important because uh, the AFL Players Association and uh, well, with respect to the new CBA between the AFLPA and the AFL, um, now, first year players or first round prospects sign a three year deal upon getting drafted. So it is relevant, very relevant, um, how long the first round is considered to be. Because that means that at pick 29, Ashton Moyer, he signs a three year deal instead of two years, as uh, would otherwise have been the case. Um, as for the bids only being placed after the first round, I'm not sure if I fully. Well, I'm trying to be realistic here. I don't think they, they do that for the Northern Academies. I think maybe NGAs outside of the first round is probably reasonable, uh, considering that's about 20 picks anyway. I don't mind that. Uh, I don't think they would do that to the Academy uh, because, I mean, it's not. I'm not saying it's not fair. It's just I don't think the AFL would do that. They would prefer to give the Northern Academies a bit of a leg up um, because they don't, well, haven't previously produced that much talent. So... What I would say is maybe as a, as a short-term compromise, maybe just have one academy player from the Northern Academies be able to match in the first round, NGAs after that, and then reassess in a few years because if we still have you know, drafts where the Northern Academies, in particular, like we saw with Gold Coast getting four first-rounders, if that becomes semi-regular, then that's where it needs to be amended. As it stands next year, I don't think it's too bad for Northern Academies. There's quite a few NGAs, but Northern Academies it's not really too uh, jam-packed full of them. So maybe this year was an outlier, we'll see. Dan, F6513 asks, which draftees for each club do you see as genuine 2021 around one prospects? Okay, given the club's development and their club's list profiles, that's a good question. So Harley Reid, yes. I think McKercher and Dersma, yes. Uh, I think McKercher's, uh, well, both of their game styles don't rely on getting in and under and winning their own ball. The one in the top 10 that probably does is Riley Sanders, but he's pretty damn ready-made, so I could see him coming in. That being said, the Bulldogs, that midfield is competitive. So, I, I, well, yeah, to get into. So I would say maybe Sanders would start as a sub, so I think he would play round one. Nick Watson should play round one. Most of that top 10, and, and they're increasingly ready-made, some of these prospects, in particular Jed Walter. I think he plays round one. 
it's probably easier to, to ask in the top 10 who doesn't play round one. Wins his line ball um, because he's an outside player as well. He could in theory, but again, maybe as the sub. Um, who else we got there? I mean, you wouldn't say O'Sullivan. Dan Curtin will because I think he won't play as a key back, whereas Co- Connor O'Sullivan will either play key back or I, I saw an article saying clubs like him as a forward, which is interesting. So we'll see what happens there. Gothard, for me, seems a little bit raw. Uh, Colton Falstrup is physically ready enough. He's been playing Waffle Seniors, so that step up um, wouldn't be too hard for him, but I would not bet on it. All the key position players, other than the ones I've mentioned, probably not. I'm trying to find someone else. Darcy Wilson probably will play round one again. An outside-leaning player who can probably play forward as a skinny player in the same way that Philippou did. I know Wilson's probably a bit smaller, uh, but I, I see that. Um, Charlie Edwards is line ball probably bet against him starting round one um, Hardiman maybe Cleary maybe Demetrio I think could um, I think he could play a role as a pressure forward I think that's usually uh, not a extremely difficult role to play Lance Collard's probably a little bit more line ball Ashton Moyer will probably take some time uh, I'm trying to look into the second round now Sean Manor absolutely Clay Hall probably physically ready enough too but I wouldn't bet on him playing in round one. So I think that's most of them. James Leak actually is quite ready-made. He could potentially play round one. Um, so I know that's answering uh, the question based on how physically ready they are. But based on all of those teams as well, uh, you know, Adelaide with Dan Curtin, I think he fits in. He's a, probably is the third tall. I saw, I think Fox Footy had him as their starting centre-half back, which I don't know if he'd play as like the second key back from day one. Uh, I think they'd give him a little bit of an easier role than that. So to summarise, I think... In the top 10, the only ones who probably aren't suitable, Nate Caddy's probably line ball. Ethan Reid, I'd imagine, wouldn't. Uh, he's way too raw. Uh, Caleb Windsor's line ball, but the others I'd probably bet on them playing uh, for, for both their physical readiness and based on you know where, where the clubs are at. I think even from Melbourne's perspective, they could probably use uh, an extra bit of injection of class on that wing, try to improve their mid-forward connection. I think that makes sense. James Leake, while ready-made, is probably got a bit of competition there in, at GWS. Obviously, it's an established team, so I don't think they're going to feel the need to maybe chuck him in in round one. Uh, whereas Darcy Wilson and maybe not Collard. I, I'd say they'd start Wilson over Collard at St Kilda, but I think Wilson, there's a spot for him there, especially with Gresham leaving the club, and uh, they obviously have a need to try and improve outside speed. So Liam Henry and Darcy Wilson, I'd imagine, start round one for St Kilda. Sorry, I know that was a bit of a rambling answer to that question, uh, but I, I just think the, the first round in particular is full of players who are likely to start round one. It all depends on fitness, I suppose, of others as well. Um, but it, yeah, it's almost easier to pick the players that, that won't start round one. Jack Phillips asks, where do you see North Melbourne after this draft? Not necessarily next season, but I can see them being a top four threat for a long time with all the talent they've drafted over the years. So, uh, okay, so next year's prediction, I, I think... Uh, I would still be conservative. I think they're going to need time to click to Clarkson um, in terms like he he didn't really get a fair run at it last year um, having to he started the season and then came in again sort of mid to late season from memory. Uh, so yeah, long story short, they're going to need some time to gel under him and I, I think they're going to play some more kids. And you almost get the sense that North Melbourne, even though they've been rebuilding for a little while now, there seems to be a lack of faith in you know a lot of those guys who are starting to enter their prime and they're well, maybe not a lack of faith in them, but certainly a lack of faith in, in what's around them. So they thought, shit, we need to hit the drive really hard, and that's exactly what they've done. And on-field performance will, will force that as well. But to answer your question, the top-end talent that they've now accumulated on their list is uh, is outstanding. And I think that midfield mix is young, but there's, there's real top-end potential there. I think LDU is potentially going to be a Brownlow medalist one day. Like, he just needs to play a full season and... Um, you know, ideally have some support with him. Obviously, George Wardlaw is also a really talented young midfielder whose body just needs to um, have a bit more luck, I suppose. Sheasel's an absolute jet. It's probably the key position, um, particularly maybe another key forward and obviously key backs that they needed to answer that question. And Will Dawson is, uh, well, he's a speculative prospect, obviously, at 18, uh, as most key position players are. Um, I would have liked to have seen them maybe invest in another one. A more ready-made one. I know they got Nuon and they got Toby Pink, but I think as a back six, they're, they're going to struggle next year based on that. The midfield long-term is is sweet. You know, Wardlaw, LDU, McKercher, Simkin, um, and Will Phillips, I suppose, supporting as well. Like, I think that's going to be a, a strength of theirs. 
Um, small forwards, they could probably use another one, but Paul Curtis looks like he's a handy type. Obviously, Nick Luck is a, a jet key forward. It's the back line for me that uh, that needs a little bit of support as well. And it'll be interesting to see where Sheasel plays his career. Is he going to be a forward midfielder? I think that's still potentially on the table for him. Um, I think going back was probably a case of getting him into the game, but also probably just filling a, a gap of what North Melbourne needed at the time. So I'll be interested to see his development and where he goes. I think he could be a genuine goal-kicking midfielder, sort of like maybe like a forward primarily like Toby Green who rolls through the midfield. That's where I see Sheasel going, and he's a top-notch player for that. So I think they have the talent, to answer your question, to go deep one day, but obviously there's so many more variables than talent in a list. But I think they're, in theory, they, they don't need to look at the draft and think we need a couple more good ones. To contrast it with West Coast, West Coast are in that position, I think. They're not quite done. Uh, whereas North Melbourne probably are at that point where they probably start trading for experienced players now. Then we have a question from Droppo Salato, who asked, do you think it was wise of the Eagles to let Dan Curtin slip, considering his versatility on the field? He can play backline, midfield, or additional tall up front, which is where I think the Eagles are lacking the most. I feel like the Eagles are banking hard on Waterman coming good. Uh, he mentions Darling, Marrick, Still has a long way to go in Oscar Allen is single-handedly carrying the forward line. Ideally, a player like Curtin would have perfectly filled that void when required and could have provided an additional big body around the contest. If our injury woes persist as per the last few seasons, having a player as versatile and classy as Curtin would have helped. Uh, as a side note, the Eagles need to change the club song. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you there, mate. Um, but yeah, in terms of your question, Dan Curtin. First of all, uh, um, you know, in terms of letting Dan Curtin slip, I, I really don't know if that's that's probably fair on West Coast because they offered their future first round pick. And uh, on paper, that was the best offer GWS got offered. It was just the case of them not wanting to trade out of like potentially getting Goddard. So we did everything that could, we could have reasonably done. I think if, we, if we'd even offered a first and a second next year, I think GWS would still have balked at it. So there wasn't too much more we could do. When Adelaide traded for GWS, according to Cal Turman, we did try and trade with Adelaide as well. So we did everything we could. And then failing that, like in Toomey's article year today, I've done a video on it myself. The Eagles tried to trade for Caddy or the live pick to get Caddy. So they did go pretty hard. But to, to address the rest of your question, I think with Dan Curtin, you highlight his versatility, but I think when taking a player that high in the draft, I think it would be good to try and pick a player and have a really good idea of where he's going to play at AFL level rather than pick a jack of all trades and try and get Dan to develop as a utility who can just go everywhere. I think for me, I don't know if I see it as a key forward. So I don't know if that was ever going to be realistic for him. Obviously, we ended up with Archer Reed, which I presume you know. Um, but I think as we did try and get Curtin and failed, it would have been nice, but I do think he's probably more a third tall, maybe develops into a genuine key back one day, um, a roaming halfback who can set up play. Like, I think we would have used that, absolutely. I just don't know if he would have contributed to the forward line. I think we're going to have to find other ways to address that. I do really like Marek and obviously Oscar Allen. Darling's about to retire. You would have thought maybe this year or next or end of 24, end of 25, out of push. Um, so I don't know if uh, Curtin would have helped that, but Archer Reed does add something different. So I, uh, I'm happy with that in the sense that he is about 203 centimeters and probably going to get taller than that. I got another question from I'm made of brown mess. Do you think the Saints made a bad call drafting Lance Collard away from his home state and the people who supported him, not just uh, his footy? I feel some players benefit a lot from the academies and not going to the club that helped the, so much with this journey might affect his career. Um, okay, interesting. So Lance Collard is a next generation academy talent for West Coast who obviously didn't get to pick 40. So St Kilda took him at pick 28. So they took a punt. Um, the, you know, obviously it's not their responsibility to not draft a kid from another club's NGA. Um, you know, that, those within the rules and other clubs did that and West Coast probably would have done the same thing if he'd been tied to someone else, in my personal opinion. So, I mean, like, Secura, um, I, I, there's, there's not only them to consider that, really, um, in the sense they'll back themselves in to support him as best they can. Do I think it was a good idea? I think there's a good chance Lance Collard is going to be a bit of a flight risk, to be honest. And I think he has signed a three-year deal because he's still technically part of the first round. And as I said earlier, the CBA rules mean that he signs a three-year deal. So they've got three years to make him feel comfortable, and they might back themselves in in that case. And that's understandable. 
On talent, I think uh, P2080 was a good selection. I think he probably would have gone earlier had there not been this little bit of noise about him potentially being a homesick if he left WA. At P28, I think it's worth a punt. Um, St. Kilda, obviously, as well, probably considering who can improve their team in the short term. I think Lance Collard, while he's skinny now, probably in a year or two, I think he could impact at AFL level. And if he's part of a winning team and a winning culture by then, who knows how he's going to feel. So I don't think they messed up, but I do think they've taken a big risk. Uh, That being said, at pick 28, I think it was probably worth the risk. So I do support their move. I don't think it's uh, their responsibility to to worry about the academy stuff. If anything, the AFL maybe needs to review that because of, you know, like other teams, West Coast invested in Collard, just like Hawthorne would have with Giath, I presume, um, and etc. So, yeah, that was my thoughts on that. Kevin Murley-Duran, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I'm just sort of saying it how people used to call Murley the, the spinner because it's the same name, right? There was two spellings of that guy's name. That always confused me. Forgive me. Uh, Kevin asks, what do you think of the Hawks forward line next year? Mitch Lewis, Nick Watson, Ginevan, Bruce, Gunston, Chol, and Dylan Moore. Yeah, when you spell it out like that, it's quite impressive. So um, you sort of break it into different chunks. You've got three smalls in Ginevan and Watson. Watson and Ginevan are a bit more the playmakers, and they both kick goals. So they're not just sort of inside 50 play. <coughs> excuse me. They're not just guys who get the ball inside 50. They they kick goals as well. So it's a dangerous mix. Um, I think Watson is a fair bit more talented than Ginevan. But Ginevan is still obviously a handy player. Dylan Moore is obviously a bit more of a high half forward. So he offsets them nicely. And he's a gun. Underrated. So then you look at... Uh, well, there's another t- small there actually. Luke Bruce. If you consider him small. He kind of plays more like a medium. Uh, I forget exactly how short he is. But either way, goal machine. Admittedly a veteran. So then you've got... Um, Maybe the tall options in Lewis, Gunston, and Chol. Gunston's obviously an aging veteran. Um, so I don't know how many goals he would necessarily kick next year, but his valuable experience in, in maybe managing that forward line and leading it, I think will come real in real handy. And uh, they've got, uh, you know, the combination of Bruce and Gunston again makes them dangerous in the short term. So I think that's a dangerous mix. And Mitch Lewis has sort of shown the promise of being a potentially 60 goal forward I think he kicked what, 37 from 15 games last year I'm not too sure but he's never played more than 15 games in a season or something like that so he just needs to get his body right but I do think that's a good mix I think all of those talls are foils for each other I think those smalls can work in tandem really well together and it's balanced and there's a mix of youth and experience and plays in their prime mind you the only one that's probably in their prime is Dylan Moore and maybe Chol you could say Chol's in his prime but he's, he's done well at AFL level in good systems. So he doesn't need to bag 50 goals. If he can bag 30, he's probably done his job. As long as uh, Mitch Lewis is also, you know, doing his part, which I think he is. Big Boy 8 BP has asked, Is Jack Watts the most failed number one draft pick in AFL history? And if so, what's your prediction on the Harley Reid? Well, I'd say there's not really a huge connection between those two concepts, just because Jack Watts was the failed number one pick. Um, it has nothing to do with Harley Reid. <laughs> but... Uh, first of all, is Jack Watts the most foul number one pick? Well, I, I looked into it a little bit, and there's a few in the 80s who were worse, like John Hutton played 36 games, Richard Lounder played four games, early days of the draft. But if you look at more modern context, I mean, I think Jack Watts had a better career than John Patton. Um, and then there's Tom Boyd as well, a little bit of a mixed bag there. I don't know if he would have played a whole career. Maybe he would have come good. Obviously, he played well in that grand final, but for the most part, he was average and... Jack Watts played 174 games. So I think where Jack Watts really... I think he, he just unfortunately became a meme just the sort of social media culture was starting to build. So that was a bit unlucky for him. And I, I think he was also really hyped, uh, which I suppose is what you're really alluding to with the Harley Reid thing. But I don't necessarily think hype is the variable there. Uh, I just think he was... Well, he was drafted at 17 for a start. And so he was pretty raw and skinny and just didn't physically develop and just very, very talented and became a good player, particularly like a back half player later in his career. Um, Then he broke his leg and had to retire. So um, talking about Harley Reid, though, it's impossible to really project it. I don't necessarily think the hype factor is necessarily going to be a predictor of how well he's going to go when you consider the hype around Will Ashcroft, Nick Dacos, to some extent, Jason Horn francis who I think is tracking okay. 
Uh, who else is there? Matty Rao. I mean, he hasn't become a star, but if you know, if the worst case scenario is Harley Reid has become Matthew Rao, it's like it's not too bad, right? So I think he's going to be okay to answer that. Would you be interested on doing? Uh, sorry, this question is from Brendan J Cook. Would you be interested in doing a summary video after each waffle round next year, focusing on the standout WA draft age players for that round heading into the twenty twenty four draft? I think it's a great idea. Uh, if you're unaware, I do live in England though. Um, and I will be living in England for the 2024 season before returning to Australia. So there's only so much I can do from here. Uh, if I'm not watching the games, I could potentially just report what other people are saying. Um, I don't know how I would do that with integrity or to make it, maybe not. it's not necessarily an integrity issue. I not, wouldn't be stealing content, but I would, uh, I don't know if I'd feel good about it because it's um, not something that I can speak on organically. I followed the draft, but I, the, the way I sort of produce content is trying to, to make an amalgamation of what everyone's saying and make predictions and, and, then I'm, and then passing that knowledge on to other people. With the waffle on a week to week basis, I don't know if I could do that. Um, could it be a segment of a weekly video where I highlight some of the top performing juniors? Maybe, maybe it could work like that. Um, but I'm not too sure how big the market would be for it. Um, that being said, like I know that doesn't sound great, but I also kind of need to consider if I put time into something like that, would it be popular? Um, it's a nice idea, but it might be something that's a little bit, I'm not quite resourced for at the moment, um, but I'll, I'll consider it. I'll consider it. It's not a bad suggestion. Um, and I think I'd probably, in an ideal world, maybe make content about the entire draft pool, or at least the top end rather than just WA. But perhaps there's a gap in the market there, so maybe somebody else can do that. By the way, go follow WA Footy Prospects on Instagram. They do great work. Leo King asks, who will be the biggest steal of the draft? Let me open my draft tab back up again. Um, the biggest steal. There's a few guys with steal potential who I think have top end potential, um, but maybe have some flaws as well. I mean, Taylor Goad, I think, will be a jet as a Ruckman. Um, at pick 20, he will probably be one that well, obviously, if he becomes good, pick 20 is going to look like a bargain. So I think there's that. Um, who else is there? I think Conor O'Sullivan as well is probably going to be a better player than pick 11 suggests. I think he's a Jet. A very, very good one. Um, other than that, like in the top range, like none of them you could say are steals as such. So we need to look at more at the uh, back end of the draft. Archie Roberts has that potential. Obviously, he went late and I can't really work out why. I think maybe erratic ball use as such. Um, it'll sound biased, but Clay Hall, I think for West Coast, I do think that is actually a bit of a steal. Not a massive steal, but I think a bit of a steal. Um, Luam on Lowell as well, pick 39. I think uh, I think I really like the look of him. And actually one big one I think is Mitch Edwards, another Ruckman in this year's draft who I think has a lot of potential, great athletic profile, underdeveloped in that he's skinny. Um, I think he actually could be the steal of the draft if I had to pick one. Um, just looking at the back end of that draft there. I'm not sure if I really see it. Obviously, Zach Ostelski is another one who went quite a bit later than we expected. Late birthday, late developer. I think late to footy as well. Um, could potentially grow to two meters tall as a key back option. Uh, I like the look of him. Obviously, no one wanted to take the risk in the first 50 picks, but those are players that I think could be steals. And then Arch, um, Ashton Moyer as well has as much upside as anyone in this draft. Apparently, dogged by a um, hip injury, I think, throughout most of... 2023 and, and uh, I think it affected his ability to train and therefore his fitness and he couldn't go that hard uh, anyway I don't know how much of that is 100% legitimate other than the fact that the injury was real so we'll see on Ashton Moyer but uh, he looked like he looks like in terms of upside up there with anyone in the draft uh, oh then the TMS726 asks who outside the top 10 would you take to become a legit star so if I narrow the focus a little bit I mean, that's kind of already the the question that I just answered. I'm just trying to see if there's anyone else outside the top 10. Probably Conor O'Sullivan. Uh, if we're looking players just outside the top 10, Taylor Goad, like I said, I'm probably just going to repeat myself there, but those are probably the ones. I, I do like the look of Charlie Edwards, but um, a little bit more speculative. He could be boom or bust, I think. Ir Ironic Mima said, so, why did I struggle saying that? Ironic Mima asks, which player outside of the top eight do you think would make the best boyfriend and why? I'm 30. This is inappropriate for me to answer. These are 18-year-old boys. <laughs> that being said, Harley Reid. No, um, I think 
I'm not going to answer this seriously. That would be weird. I know it's a joke question anyway. Uh, but I will say that if I had a 18 year old daughter, uh, which is not wildly unrealistic, man, I'm old. Uh, it is unrealistic though. Um, but I would say that Harvey Johnson, who just got drafted to the Eagles, is the sort of kid you want your daughter to bring home. He seems like an absolute gentleman. So that's who I would say. It seems like the loyal type as well. Cooper Simpson as well said he uh, wants to be a world club player. He's not going to cheat on you. So let me know how you get on with that. Uh, Stuart Yelland says, what would have to happen to uh, unite both the Dersma and Reed brothers at um, Essendon? For the, I think... I think if Zane joined Xavier, it would have to be because he's failed at North Melbourne. That's the only way I can see that happening, <laughs> to be honest. Um, big players don't move to just play with their mates and brothers often. As I say that, I'm sure there's probably exceptions to that. Um, but I feel like it'd be more like him getting a lifeline at Essendon. So that's what would have to happen there. And Archer Reed and Zach Reed, I feel like... I feel like that's almost a case of Archer Reed would have to really succeed at West Coast to then be able to dictate where he gets traded to. Does that make sense? So if, if Archer Reed really succeeds at West Coast, then then he might get traded to Essendon because once a player builds a profile, they're a bit more comfortable requesting trades home, right? Um, so I think that would be one option. Whereas if Zach Reed, sorry, Archer Reed doesn't come on and he struggles at West Coast, he's probably going to have a harder time finding a club to take him. Um, Zane will always have the high profile. So I think that's the distinction between the two. Zane would be a failed former high draft pick. Archer has to be a successful player to get a trade. He can't be a failed second rounder. Um, yeah, that, that's maybe over answering the question. I think this might be the last question. Chunky Footy asks, would you rather only eat Big Macs for 10 years or only drink chocolate milk for 10 years? Oh my God. Both of those options are horrible, but I suppose that's the point, right? Um, I would probably go Big Macs. Like, I I do love McDonald's, I'm not going to lie. I actually haven't had it since April, because I haven't found one nearby. <laughs> actually, that's not true. I had some in Dublin, I think, or Glasgow. Um, anyway, yeah, I'd probably go Big Macs. I don't... With chocolate milk, like, am I foregoing water? Or is it just instead of regular milk? That would be awful. No, I love coffee. I'm already excited for my morning coffee tomorrow. It's my favorite part of my day. Uh, so yeah, Big Macs for 10 years. Oh my God. But in this scenario, I'm really over answering this, but in this scenario, do I have to cop the like the cal- caloric content? Like if I'm having Big Macs a day, what are they like 600 calories each? I don't even know. Does that mean I can have like maybe three and a half a day that to hit like two and a bit thousand. That's kind of what I'm eating at the moment. Uh, do I have to keep that in mind or can I just eat as much as I want until I'm full? Cause then I would just get fat. If I answer this anymore, I'm probably answered it longer than any other question. So I probably should stop. But anyway, thank you very much for tuning into true footy podcast. What I think is 104. Thank you very much. It's been great. I am considering what to do next. Like I said, uh, I'm going to be making daily content on, on the cricket stuff. And, um, you know, footy content here and there when I've got something to say. And uh, birthday podcast part two is going to come out. And then I'm thinking of firing up the podcast interviews I used to do with other creators in this space. So we'll see. I've got to get something to keep me busy over the winter here in England, where it is minus three degrees at the moment, I think. It's great stuff. Um, But hopefully my main goal is to sustain this so that I don't need to get a job. How cool would that be? That'd be a great goal. So thank you very much for your questions, guys. Thank you for listening. Uh, Thank you for being subscribed to the channel. And I'll see you in the next piece of content I do, whatever that is. See ya.